A quick recap from video number one. I found water in the oil, so let's get the cylinder head off, check if it's warped, and fix it if it is. I started with the exhaust manifold. With everything being so accessible on these 7 style cars, this is a really easy job to do. Intake manifold next. I'll just get the air filter out of the way. I think Honda did a really good job of designing this engine. There really isn't a lot you have to remove to be able to get the manifolds off. I took the AUX belt off just to make turning the engine by hand a little bit easier. You can take the tension off the belt by just pulling the tensioner with a spanner. Then I just tucked it out of the way so it didn't get damaged. I had to just unclip a couple of hoses to get in at a bracket that supports the intake manifold. This is just so that the whole weight of the manifold isn't hanging off of the side of the head. The screws in the bottom? They were properly tight. Then it was on to unbolting the manifold from the head. The universal joint on the end of a long extension makes getting in at some of the more inaccessible screws really easy. And they're all 12mm, so my 10mm socket is still safely in the toolbox. Oh, there's that magnet on a stick again. I'm telling you guys, it's super handy. And off it comes. Oh, I just forgot that little electrical connector. Never mind, there it goes. Just make a little bit more space to get the cylinder head off. The rocker cover was already loose from the end of episode 1. I put a big spanner on the end of the crankshaft and just turned it round slightly to get the number 1 cylinder up to top dead centre. When these two little marks on the pulley line up with the top edge of the cylinder head, I know that it's in the correct position. Then I can check these two little marks on the camshafts line up and that gives me a visual reference so that when I put the engine back together everything goes back in exactly the same position. This is really important. A mistake here could mean that we end up with valves hitting pistons when we try and restart the engine. To take the timing chain off you've first got to remove the tensioner. Under this cover there's a little adjuster screw that needs taking out and replacing with a set screw or in this case a bit of threaded rod that will preload the tensioner which means I can take it out and put it back in at the same position. I just tightened it up with a little ratchet spanner and then did up a lock nut to make sure that once it was removed it didn't adjust itself. I could then remove the tensioner and the housing all as one unit. A little bit of gentle leverage just to help the o-rings to unstick. This is the VTEC valve. It doesn't need to be removed, but it's a little bit vulnerable sat out there on the side of the head while I'm working on it, so I thought it was best to get it out of the way just in case. Before I take the camshafts out, I loosened off all of the valve clearance adjusters. This is just to make sure there's no preload pushing up through the rockers onto the camshafts when I take them out. You can see the valve spring decompressing here as I unscrew the adjuster. This is taking any force off of the camshaft, so when I take it out it doesn't pop. Camshaft holders next. They're a two-piece design, so I have to take all the screws out and then take the tops off first. It doesn't really matter what order you do these in, but I like to try and undo them all nice and evenly just for my own peace of mind. I do about a third of a turn per screw per pass. Once they're loose, they just lift out, and I keep them in order so that they go back in the same place. They are actually numbered, but I figure keeping them in order is just a good habit. One day I might be working on something that isn't quite so thoughtfully designed. Intake cam first, carefully does it. I don't want to damage the holders. Then the exhaust. Again, these are both labelled, just to make sure they go back in the correct places. I just put a couple of the screws loosely back in to make sure when I pop the lower holders up they don't rapidly disassemble themselves all over the workshop floor. A couple of very gentle taps and some strategically placed leverage and they come straight up. There we go, 
now we're getting somewhere. The last thing before tackling the head bolts is the cam chain sprocket. Nope, I need a longer allen key. There we go, much better. I put a screwdriver through the sprocket to make sure that once I take the screw out, it doesn't all just fall down the hole into the timing case. It's a bit of a faff getting the timing chain off, because there's also a little washer in there that I don't want to drop down inside the case either. There we go, bolt out, and I can just hook the timing chain with the screwdriver while I remove the gear. Onto the head bolts. That quarter inch drive is just not going to cut the mustard here. Looks like it's time to crack out the half inch bar. There we go, now they're moving. Now when you're loosening head bolts, it's really important that you follow a specific sequence, but the basic principle is you start at either end and work your way towards the center. This is so that you don't create any unnecessary stress concentrations in the head and cause it to warp by having one end all the way done up and the other end all the way loosened. Once they're all undone, I stuck them in some cardboard so I knew which one went in which hole. I noticed there was a tiny little ledge inside the timing case that I could rest the timing chain on, so I just carefully popped it down inside before lifting the head. A couple more strategically placed bits of leverage with the ISO workshop levering tool, a finger in the hole, and a firm grip around the back of the head, and off she came. That doesn't look too bad. Let's get this on the bench. Take the old head gasket off. Clean up the liquid gasket from the timing case hole with a sharp Stanley knife. I just gave the head a really light stoning to get rid of any burrs that I might have created while removing it from the engine. Time to check if the cylinder head's warped from the overheating problem. I'm using a precision straight edge and a 0.05mm, which is about two thousandths of an inch, feeler gauge. If the feeler gauge goes underneath the straight edge at any point, then the head's out of tolerance and it needs to be skimmed. Uh oh, looks like we've got some work to do. My initial plan was to skim the head using the fly cutter that I made in last week's video on the Bridgeport milling machine. So I set about doing some test cuts on the machine, because I've never skimmed anything this big on this machine before. The flatness tolerance for the cylinder head is 0.05mm over half a metre, or two thousandths of an inch over about 20 inches. Unfortunately, I found that this was unlikely to be achievable, due to too much wear in the ways on the x-axis, causing the machine to cut with a bow. This is probably because the machine was formerly in a pattern maker's shop where it spent its entire life running without any oil on the ways. So here's plan B, a makeshift lapping board on the table of the milling machine made from an old mirror, some tape and some optimism. I checked it for flat with a precision straight edge and some one thou shim. I was very pleasantly surprised actually. Luckily, I had an offcut from a roll of 80 grit abrasive paper, so I didn't have to worry about sticking lots of little bits of abrasive paper together, I could do it all in one piece. I just stuck it down with some masking tape, and then made sure there wasn't any debris on it that was going to embed itself onto the bottom of the cylinder head. Using some engineer's blue, I blued up one side of the straight edge. It occurred to me while I was doing this that if I didn't have the blue, you could probably get away with using some boot polish for this. By rubbing the straight edge back and forwards on the bottom of the cylinder head, it transfers the blue onto the high spots of the head so that you can see where they are. You can see here that we've got a high spot at either end of the head. Hopefully we shouldn't need too much sanding to knock this down to back with intolerance. Let's give it a go shall we? Put it down nice and gently 
and then I just give it a little bit of a wiggle to make sure I haven't trapped any grit between the sandpaper and the head. I'm not pushing down at all here, I'm just letting the weight of the head do all the work. Time for a little check on progress. You can see that we've got a much larger blue area now, and that tells us that we've got a much larger area of contact that's flat, i.e. a much larger high spot. What's interesting though, is that we now haven't got any blue at either end. This means that the lapping table is slightly concave, so we just need to keep an eye on that. I give the board a really good clean between each lapping session. Each time I lap, I go in a slightly different direction. I find that this helps to keep the pressure on the bottom of the part nice and even, just in case you're accidentally putting a little bit more weight on one side than the other. Time for a final check. The correct way to check a cylinder head is down both sides, across both ends, and then diagonally from corner to corner in both directions. So the cylinder head's back in tolerance and ready to go back on the engine. Thanks for watching.